Um, hello, everyone, and um, welcome. I'm really excited. For, I'm excited for this book. I'm excited for this teaching. Uh, I, I, everybody can hear me? Okay. Um, so I, I, uh, I think it's good. Um, so uh, I just want to say one of the things I was one of the things I lo love about this community is that somehow uh, we created a space here where there are um, a lot of people who are just exploring Judaism, you know, just as if they walked in off the street for the first time, and also a, like a preponderance of rabbis and scholars in our community. That doesn't seem like it would naturally go together, but it does very naturally go together here. There's some sort of alchemy that we've created that, that brings both of those, both of those uh, d demographics together, and actually it's in the bringing them together that some of the magic in this community happens and everybody is enriched by by each other that's 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 how i i find myself in this community one of the advantages of that alchemy is that you know we got Talmide Chachami, we got real scholars like lurking around every corner here like real real like high level judaism just like in people's pockets here and that we really have in rabbi neil um who has been uh, a teacher at milken for nearly 20 years a teacher at huc um is a friend and a colleague. I think all of the rabbis here um, feel enriched by, by Rabbi Neil's uh, warmth and also his scholarship. And I, I, I say all this because this book, um, which, uh, which uh, we're sort of introducing here today and we'll continue to study together as a community, is very much a kind of an echo of that dialogue between the highest levels of scholarship and those of us who are just sort of trying to figure out what this is all about. And this book is really taking some of the biggest questions, marshalling some of the, the deepest sources and presenting them in a way that is, that is accessible, that is digestible, that is absolutely relevant to anyone who might just wander in off the street. So it's really like, it's, it's a beautiful book and also kind of a testament to the kind of dialogue that we really celebrate here. So um, without further ado, I, I introduce my friend and colleague, Rowan Nielsen. Thanks so much. That, that describes so well what I tried to accomplish in this book. I'm going to take that clip off. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if the mic's on or not. I'm doing all I can, folks. Um, and you just, I'm going to take, I'm going to take what you just said off the, off the video of this. And we're going to use it as promotional materials. Absolutely. Can't get too many blurbs for this book. I want to, I want to thank Rabbi Sharon, which is there um, also for, um, for supporting my doing, my doing this series and uh, Andrea and she get a lot of credit for the whole thing coming together. Uh, okay, so we're starting a little a little later than we, than we planned. We must be the far. So let me. Okay, I'm gonna wait for that too. Um, let, let me just dive in. So I'm going to this. Uh, I'm gonna this. I'm just saying this to um, to give Devor a little smile. Nobody else will get this reference. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. I have a preface and an introduction, and then we'll uh, then we'll study some. Uh, then we'll study some material from uh, from my book. Uh, it was also, I believe, it was also really nice uh, when I got pulled up for an Aliyah to see um, Rabbi Morris's copy of the book and Rabbi Sharon's copy of the book that have obviously already been uh, opened and read. You know, I've been used to just seeing these pristine copies, uh, which you can arrange to buy from your car, and we'll, we'll work out some kind of a nice discount. One of my ethical principles is don't buy retail. Um, okay. Uh, so the preface, the preface is this, um, for, as was mentioned, you know, for many years, in the 18 years, as it turned out, I taught Jewish ethics in a high school setting here in Los Angeles, in a, in a day school. And it, it turned out that I had to convince teenage students that ethics is actually a field of study, right? And that Judaism has something to contribute. Yeah, they, they would kind of say, well, ah, Rabbi Shannon, like, this is, this is nice, but, you know, like, if I had confronted some issue, like, I'd know what was the right thing to do. So, uh, you know, remaining calm, I would ask, and how would you know, how would you reach a decision? Like, so, you know, my morals and values. Oh, okay. And where might those come from? Right? So, there. The, um, what I want to give you a sense of today and in the sessions that I follow is the method of, so to speak, doing Jewish ethics that evolved in response to that and the, and the way that I write in the book. Uh, so we're, we're going to look at as 
aspects, not completely, but we're going to take a, an initial look at one of the case studies in the book uh, today. And in, in future sessions, we'll do, we'll do more complete case studies, um, particularly we're choosing to do stuff out of biomedical ethics that I think are really at the cutting edge and that I think we can um, get excited about and hopefully argue about. Okay, that's the preface. Here's the introduction. What is ethics? Who wants to throw out a, a, a definition, like a working definition? What are we even talking about? Here? Principles. Principles. Thank of you. Behavior. Principles of behavior. Any other ideas? I mean, it's a good answer. But any other ideas? Moral code. Moral code. Okay. So what? I, the here's the definitions I use in the book. I distinguish between morals and ethics. Okay, this is not the only definition that's out there. Any, um, any people with philosophy degrees, like don't, don't um, blame me for this, but I, the way I, I work with it is this. Morals are the standards of good behavior, right? The values that guide our judgments, morals. But ethics is the study of how do we apply those basic values or principles in actual situations. Um, and as we'll see, the real challenge is not how do we distinguish between something that's moral, right? What's good and what's bad? Like that, that tends to be pretty easy, right? Okay, should I punch Rabbi David Kasher in the nose? Okay, so that, you know, nonviolence is probably a moral value, especially in this community. Um, so, that's not a hard ethical call, right? The real challenge in, of ethics is when two goods, two good things, right? When two moral values conflict with each other, come into play in the same situation. The passage louder than the I do want to get bottled up. Yeah. All right. Let me try because I don't know how many planes that is there. Um, so the, the study of ethics teaches us ways to um, kind of weigh the various goods against each other and then make the best possible decision that we can reach. And I would add the best decision that we can reach for that situation, right, in that moment. Because I'm not, I'm not convinced that there's ever a, a, a pure, perfect ethical decision we can make now and for always, right? I, one of the things I think that emerges from the, the study in the book is that we have to look at circumstances and we have to look at individual people who are involved in real life situations. We can't make these decisions in the abstract. And that probably explains why it's so valuable that if we're going to think about ethics, that we use case studies like I do to typify the issues, and then we can kick around what should this person do. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna get to one of those. You know, when I complete this utterly fascinating and compelling introduction. Um, okay, so I would like to. Um, I want to review just like really really quickly um, and incompletely some basic theories about ethics and try to think with you about how Judaism does or doesn't use any of these uh, approaches to the idea of ethics. Uh, and then, so I'm, I'm just gonna do this and I'll give you the handout after this part. Um, the first one is called virtue ethics. Okay, virtue ethics means we identify virtues, qualities that an individual should try to cultivate and use those to make ethical decisions. So to, this goes back to the, a lot of the classical Greek thinkers, right? So if we, they agree on certain virtues, wisdom, honesty, sincerity, for example, a person should cultivate. And then when we confront a, an ethical dilemma, we ask ourselves, what does wisdom dictate? What is the, what do I do if I want to insist on being honest, et cetera, et cetera. Virtue ethics. Um, 
approach. Judaism has, I would say, it has some elements of a virtue ethics, right? The Torah tells us, uh, right? like, do what's right, do what's good. Now, I realize there are many uh, questions, that raises as many questions as it answers, right? Do, just do what's good. Okay, not, not 100% satisfactory, but right? it doesn't guide me in every circumstance. Another theory is called generally consequentialism. Consequentialism. We decide what is right based on the, its consequences, right? What will the outcome be of this course of action? If it leads to good, then it's good and ethical. If it leads to bad, then it's bad and, and not so ethical. You, you may be familiar with a, a specific consequentialist theory called utilitarianism. Many have heard that word, right? It comes into political philosophy as well, where we say, what does the greatest, what has the greatest beneficial effect to the greater number of people? Okay, I, I write in the book that, that Judaism doesn't go with consequentialism, right? Judaism has something beyond, like, what's the outcome of this to do ethics? So uh, at least one person who has already adopted my book for teaching 12th graders at a, a day school in, in Irvine, um, has, has actually already argued with me about this and, and said that, well, you know, look, sometimes the rabbis say um, this, this ought to be the law, but we'll change it um, right, to, to uh, correct the world because we don't think it leads to a good outcome. Maybe that's consequentialism. Maybe. Third kind, I'm going to I'm going to cover five theories. Third theory, do, an ethics based on duty. We have certain duties, okay? That means that there are moral principles that apply always and everywhere, right? In every place and all periods of time. Now that you can see how the Torah, the, the, you know, the revealed Torah from Sinai uh, represents a kind of duty ethics, right? It says that all members of the covenant of Israel have certain responsibilities, certain ways they have to live always and everywhere however that spells out. So it's, in some ways, um, that, is, that is the Jewish notion, spelling out our ethical duties under our covenant with God. It's not, I, I argue, the fourth theory, which is contract ethics. This is um, mainly the idea of the social contract, right? That we, we form a society based on certain implicit and explicit agreements that we, we have with each other. And the, the right thing to do is determined by the social contract. Um, I argue in the book that we shouldn't imagine that the, the value of greed, of covenant in Jewish tradition implies a contract ethics because I think we can only have a contract between parties of equal power. And if there's, if there's a divine commander, however we understand that, right, giving us mitzvot, however we understand that, it can't, there can't be an equality between us and that authority figure. So I don't really see it in those terms. Uh, and the last, this is kind of a, a, a postmodern approach to ethics that's based on care. Rejects the idea of rules and contracts, and it it values relationships over rules. And the basic insight is that the right thing to do is whatever uh, builds and supports our relationships, human relationships. Um, as, you, as you can readily uh, tell, a lot of that comes out of feminist theory, uh, though not, not exclusively. And there are some people working in contemporary Jewish thought who are working on uh, interpreting Jewish tradition as a kind of ethics of care, right? Because we build loving community among, among our fellow Jews. Um, so any, it, several of these are possible. And the, the last point I wanna make, two of, actually two points, uh, uh, by, in, by, by way of introduction. One, that to the extent that I'm right and Judaism is often expresses itself through a duty form of ethics, then it expresses that through law, right? Through halakha, 
And that explains in, in just one sentence why the preponderance of the texts that I invite people to study in the book are texts of, that present themselves as law, right? They provide norms from which we, we try to derive moral values that help us make ethical decisions. Within that, though, we quickly realize, and this is the second and final point, that these texts are, in modern terms, um, multivocal, right? There's multivocality in the text, right? There, there is, I, I would argue, like, well, this is one of my intellectual commitments, thank you, that there, there is no such thing as a Jewish view on anything important. Right? The one exception to that might be that there's a single Jewish view, that there's a single God. Okay. But on you know, any, anything else of importance, it's really hard to convince me that there's not multiple voices saying multiple things about this, and even to the extent of contradicting each other. All right. The front of the handout has theories of ethical decision making and the five words that I just reviewed with you in a box at the top. And then a text that we are going to study together to, I hope, to underline my point about the multivocality of the system. And the Hebrew term that I want, uh, I would like you to know, which I, I know we've heard from our rabbis at, at Ikar, is machloke, right? the notion of a productive dispute about something important, right? That we can debate while remaining part while remaining in community with one another. <clears throat> so this comes from the introductory material to the book where it says text two, and it comes from the Talmud in Eruvin 13b. Um, I think we probably have heard this taught at Ikar before, but it, it always rewards further study. And here you see the, the actual layout of the book, um, except when, when you buy a copy of the book, you don't have that watermark in the back, it says University of Nebraska Press, and right? that's, uh, that's the advantage you get for your, your expenditure of, of dollars. Um, okay, so, and you see below the text, there are questions for inquiry. So this is, if you are either um, teaching from the book or if you're studying it with a friend, it's a great idea to, to read, read through the text carefully and think about the questions while I'm trying to direct you toward how is it going to help How's this text going to help you think about the, the case studies in this chapter? Uh, in this case, it's in the introduction, so we're learning something about how Jewish ethics is done. All right, so let's read A Ravine 13b together and see what it's, see what it's talking about. Sir? Where is Ravine 13b? What text is it? Oh, it's in the Talmud. It's in the Babylonian Talmud. A Ravine is a, is a tractate. In the, uh, at the and it, the main its main subject is some some complex rules about Shabbat uh, and the, the limits of where we're allowed to go and do on Shabbat. But in the course of it, this story comes up. Any other questions uh, before we go and in, dive into the text? Great. Okay. So by by partial prearrangement, Rabbi Len Murak is going to read this for us, and then we'll talk. <laughs> said that Shmuel said for three years the school of Shabbai and the school of Hillel disputed. He said the halakha is as we say and he said the halakha is as we say. Let me read the whole thing. Yes, please. A heavenly voice went out and said these and these are the words of the living God and the halakha is as the school of Hillel said. Actually, he'll, um, Len, let's pause. I, I changed my mind. Thanks. Let's yeah. pause. Let's break there. Um, let's break there. Okay, what I'm going to ask you the first question for inquiry, right? What what could it mean to say these and these are the words of the living God? What's the message? It's all true. Okay, she said it's all true. It's all true. Do all the, it's all divine. I, I'm sorry. It's all divine. It's all divine. Okay, so it's all true. It all partakes of divinity rights of. Both the, what the school of Shammai says and what the school of Hillel says, they're all in touch somehow with what God wants us to know. Now, what's the problem here? Okay, let's just take, uh, this is a very familiar example, and since we're all um, aware that Hanukkah is looming over us, right, in, in a week or something, 
like that. Um, the Shammai says that we should light eight lights on the first night of Hanukkah and, redu- and take one away every night. The Hillel says we should light one on the first night and add one every night. Now, I know you all know how we light the candles, but if we just read that debate in the Talmud, what would be the issue that we would confront? If you just say, well, those and those are the words of the living God, up or down. What am I actually going to, what do I do when uh, Sunday night of Hanukkah rolls around? How do I know what to do? Like we have to do something, right? Okay, so that's the first implication. But now the Talmud is now, oh, and notice though, what's the second thing that the heavenly voice says? The halacha is as the school of Hillel says. Don't let me catch you lighting eight lights on the first night of Hanukkah, right? We, all, we always, almost always, we follow the school of Hillel. Now, the Talmud is now going to ask the next logical question. Rebbe. Since these and these are the words of the living God, on what basis did the school of Hillel deserve to have the halakha established according to their words? Finish. Because these were caught me to you because they were kind and humble, and they taught their words and the words of the school of Shammah. And not only that, Thank you very much. Okay, think about think about it for a sec. And now I'm gonna we're gonna talk about it kind of in reverse order. Let's first talk about the end of the text. What kind of reasons are these for choosing to prefer Bet Hillel, the school of Hillel over the school of Shama? What kind of reasons are these? Same with you, Josh, you want to say something? Mm-hmm. They respect Shammai's opinions. Thank you. What else? They're altruistic. They're altruistic. Interesting. Jake. They're process oriented. Okay, it's a pro- Jake says it's a process oriented answer. Notice it's not, um, in, yeah. Substance. Uh, it's not a substantive thing, and it can't be right because these and these are the words of the living God. <laughs> like you can't say Benilla is a better answer, because then how would Beishamai be the words of the living God? Or, you know, so they're both. As I, I'm remembering a, a um, I'm, re- I'm remembering one of my teachers from JTS kind of going, they're both true, right? Like it makes your mind, your head explode. They're, they're both true. So what have we got? We have process and respect. It's the, um, Sammy's point I want to underline. Notice the Hillel, they're kind, they're humble. They show intellectual humility. I think, what does it represent that I, I talk about the words of my opponents before my own ideas? I think it's a kind of intellectual humility. And it says, I could be wrong. Right? It doesn't mean I don't have a strong opinion. It doesn't say, you know what, Beit Shammai, we're going to concede to you. But it does say we are going to take your idea seriously. Is it, more of, a, is it more of a confidence, you know, that mm-hmm. like a soft confidence that I'm actually going to put them? It's like, it is humility, but it's also like a little bit of like, I know my opinion's right. I'm going to show you the other opinion first, but I'm also going to be a little... Oh, nice. And then point out, there's actually great confidence to be able to say... I know I'm, I'm so sure I'm right. I can show you the other side even before I tell you what, what I consider the right answer. Okay, but notice within all of it, these and these remain true at the same time. I mean, well, these and these are demonstrative from right? right. So what they refer to depends on the context of what's being named. So it actually Okay, I mean, you put that really beautifully. Thank you. These and these, she says, represents 
it, they're demonstrative pronouns that depend on the context of what they're referring to. Am I getting this right? Um, so it will depend on what's the ethical issue and what are the opinions that we're looking at. Brilliant, right? And what, just what I, I want to use it here to, for us to note that it's possible to say these and these are the words of the living God. Words, I, I'll present you with a case study with ethical, an ethical dilemma and we may reach different conclusions. And it's possible that they're both uh, in some way the word of the living God, right? We can possibly draw different conclusions from the same Jewish tradition or traditions plural. Rabbi, are you looking to comment? Well, I just mean, what's the like, usual is for the, for the Bible, 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 for the we need to stay in community, right? And it it um it reemphasizes also how our our tradition, our texts, always preserve the voices that that were overruled in the end, whether through rabbinic debate or in the as Eva says in these two or three cases that we know of through a bach call, a heavenly voice coming down to really decide everything. Uh, the, nevertheless, those dissenting, those minority voices are always preserved, right? And we sometimes we want to come back to them. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm doing a lot of great commercials here, I feel like for my own work. If you, if you come, as you go through the book, you'll see instances where uh, contemporary Jews uncomfortable with aspects of the ethical tradition that we've received will solve it that discomfort by reviving a voice that's been overlooked, right? That's one route. And you can say, well, look, you know, we have, we, now we can follow the sort of Shama approach to this as it were, as it were. Um, okay, let me, let me go on as well, trying to um, leave time for the uh, for Shabbat naps here, since we, since we ran a little bit late. Um, before we flip over the page, if, if you can resist the temptation, um, the, I just, a, a bit of a trigger warning. I, I chose um, to bring um, one of the case studies from the parents and children chapter, and it's about an abusive parent. So I just want everyone to know that before we even read it. Okay? With, now you have permission to, you know, if you've all been good boys and girls, you've um, and um, gender expansive ex people, you can turn it over and um, we'll look at the case study. Uh, so this is, again, I, I'm just bringing you, you clips from within chapter one of the book here. Um, case study number three is called Distancing from an Abusive Parent. So let's, even before we look at, at the case, um, though half of you have already read it, um, what is the, um, what's the basic moral responsibility to our parents that we have from the Torah? I think you can probably answer this how. Okay, where do we, how do we know we have to honor our father and our mother? Right, it's the fourth, the, ten, the big ten, you know, the first ten commandments, right? Also, and what's in the, uh, what, you know, all of us went to liberal seminaries, the holiness code, right? What's in, what's in Leviticus 19.3? To revere. To revere. In fact, actually, as a matter of fact, the Rabbi Feig and I were working in the same school. We used to teach a whole unit to ninth graders about what, What's the difference between honoring your parents and revering your parents, right? There's extensive halakha on this, right? Actually, much to my surprise, there's so much halakha on it that the, the chapter on parents and children turned out to be one of the longest chapters in my book. And it, that kind of happened without prior intent, you know, in the outline. Okay, case, this is the third case study in that chapter, okay? And, and Andy, you get the privilege here to uh, read it to us. That's right. Sarah had a difficult child. Her mother regularly insulted her looks and intelligence. Her mother inflicted corporal punishments, beating her at times in physically abusive ways. <clears throat> Once she left her home for college and she decided it would be best to avoid her mother. She never visited 
and only rarely spoke to her mother on the phone. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, thinking about the two verses that we just cited about honoring and revering one's parents, and the, there's an incredibly elaborate halakha about how do we do those exactly? How do we put those into practice? And in principle, no Jew is excused from this, right? There's, these are duties owed, simply owed to our parents. And there's also, lest you worry, there's also an elaboration of, uh, of what parents need to do for their children in raising them. Uh, Sam, you remember the exact citation for that, right? Because we studied it together. Um, we studied it together. So here's, here's something that, that I always like to do when we're learning, when we're studying one of these case studies. So don't look at any text yet. What, what are your instincts about this case? Like, what should Sarah do? Should she stay away from her mother the rest of her life? Or should she act out some obligations to her mother, let's say as her mother, her mother may age and need some help? Um, what are the rights and wrongs? What do you think? She should help her mother grow up. She should, what do you mean? She should oh, help she, her mother grow up? She should maybe guide her in the ways that she does not give her. Ah, okay, so she should try to kind of go back and redeem her childhood, right? In a, Teach, sense, she, yeah. show, in a sense, and show her mother how a child should be raised. That's, is that my understanding? Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. What do others think? Well, let's have some multivocality. Yeah. Well, on the theory that every life has a possibility of redemption, ah. you know, going back and, you know, until the very end of one's life, there's always the hope. Okay, so we always, until, right, we say this on Yom Kippur many times, right, until the very last moment, there's a hope a person can do tshuva, can redeem themselves. So she, um, Sarah should go back in, in the hopes. Um, David? Well, is, is honoring a one-time obligation, or is it a now Okay, so, I mean, if you just, if you open the sources, you're going to find out it's never-ending. As long as your parents, actually, you know what, it goes beyond your parents' death, right, because if you look in the Mishnah Torah, it talks about, how you have to show honor to your parent even in talking about them after their death. So it's actually never in a literal sense. There was a hand in the back left. Yeah. Difficult thing, but in uh, eye for an eye, you know, ends up being that you don't do that, but instead there's a monetary way mm. to follow that edict. So maybe the same can be applied here that you have to respect your parents and not be a reverend, but a bonus of being it can be a heavy deal to have to then. Very nice, and you can, I'm going to come right back to you. You, could, you had an idea like that? Thank you. What's your name, sir? Because I haven't. Yeah, nice to meet you. The um, and what's what um, one of the things that, that that reminds me of, right, is that there it's um, it's established already in the medieval halacha that if the burden of care becomes too heavy for the child, then you're allowed to pay for people who are capable of doing it to take care of your parent. How, the interesting thing though, is that they talk about that in terms of, this is my case study number two in chapter one. And that's about the, um, the parent who um, like, well, the way I set up the case study is a parent with dementia, progressing dementia, right? Where it becomes too hard for, like a child doesn't want to change their own parent's diapers, for example, right? And so there, 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 are, there are paragraphs in the halakha that make it relatively easy for you to say, as long as I'm providing the best care that I'm able to pay for for my parent, then I'm doing my, my duty. But they don't, they don't go there necessarily in terms of this case, right? Where the parent didn't carry out her obligation as a parent, her moral obligations as a parent, right? So it's very, um, there are things on the other side where you look like you need to contribute. I think, I think that, you know, we have to consider that for Sarah, I'm not Sarah to engage a woman who has been both verbally and physically abusive is, is nuts. I mean, why should she put herself in danger for a person who is she knows has a history of Thank you. See, this is this. Well, Julie, go, go. Uh, well, I, 
Did everybody hear the word? No. Why should she basically the problem for Sarah is that this is a woman who has verbally and physically abused her. Why should she endanger her own safety? Uh, you know, both emotional and physical safety. Thank you, Julie. I don't know if this is part of the ethic of the consequentialism or the ethic of fear, but there's also um, a need to understand the root cause of the parental abuse so that she can interrupt that cycle mm -hmm. when she herself becomes a Okay, so Julie's suggesting Sarah Sarah needs to figure out what, what's at the root of her mother's abusive behavior, lest she, Sarah, end up repeating that if she becomes a parent, right? Which is psychologically right on target, right? It's a really difficult thing. I wanna I wanna just go back so we notice in terms of uh, my whole my idea that I like to stress that like what's fun in doing ethics like this is that we have to weigh these these good things against each other. On the one hand, right, it's good to it's good to uh, you know honor your parent, right? It's good to take care of one's parents when when that's appropriate. And on the other side, Sarah's safety is also an important good here, right? and the safety of Sarah's future children, should there be any. And those two are uh, hard to reconcile. I don't want to say irreconcilable, but it's hard to reconcile those. That's what makes it. I think a, a, a case study that's worth looking at. Now, just one for one more taste of text. They're obviously in the chapter. More incentive for you to get the book and read it. <laughs> um, there's um, there are obviously more texts that can shed some light on this. But I want I wanted purposely to bring this one that relates directly to Sarah's dilemma. And that also underscores the point I was making when we studied the other passage from the Talmud, the part from Erevi. Text 14, that's text number 14 in chapter 1. It's from the Shulchan Aruch. This is a medieval code of halacha, code of Jewish law. Uh, we use the word code for works that try to summarize the, the law up to the time that the author is writing it. In other words, it's not a book of, of debates, right? But it's a book of... If you want to know what I was talking about before, how do I light candles on the first light of Hanukkah? You can open up the Shulchan Aruch, and it tells you first light, one light, second light, two lights, etc. So the Shulchan Aruch um, is a code, but it, it's a and it's a it's a widely accepted code. But what's interesting about this code is that it has both a Sephardi author and an Ashkenazi sort of commentator whose, wor whose words are incorporated right into the main body of the text. So if there's some difference in the practice between Jews from the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern countries versus Jews from Europe and Northern Europe, Northern and Eastern Europe, I should say, then uh, Moshe Israelis, who, um, who wrote these, these additional comments on the Shofan Aruch, will tell us, and it's right there in the main body of the text. So it's a wonderful, we get wonderful examples of Masloke right here. All right, this, this one time I'll take a volunteer reader, uh, if somebody's willing to project. Fine. So the, the, in square letters, we have the main text, and I'll read it, you know, be that way. In the, um, in, the main, in the square letters, that's the main body of the Shulchan Aruch, written by Rabbi Yosef Karo. I'm sorry, and I should have said the Shulchan Aruch was published in 1550, 1550. Uh, and Moshe Israelis was from Poland, that's what I have in italics. So, Kara writes, even if one's father, represent that as parents, okay, but in our minds, but I'm translating what he wrote. Even if one's father was wicked and sinful, the son honors him and shows him reverence. Okay, it should be clear what that tells Sarah, right? But right on the next line, note means here's something from Israelis, right? From the Ashkenazi authority in the same book, Israelis writes, but there are those who say, one is not obligated to honor a wicked father unless he has repented. Now, <laughs> what implications so if I brought you this text and said, what should Sarah in the case study do? What conclusion do you draw? 
depends whether she's smart or not. I'm sorry, a little laugh. Depends whether she's smart or not. Ah, okay, so one possibility is, all right, are you Sephardi or Ashkenaz, right? Okay, fantastic. So Sephardi have to honor their abusive mothers and Ashkenazim, ha, 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 don't. That's one way to go. I read. Question. Okay, the question was if we're supposed to maintain Mahloka and the multivocality of the tradition, then what's the status of something like the Shafan Ruf that tries to boil it down to here's what you do? And the, the answer in a word is controversial, right? Like it's historically controversial. Um, and um, one, uh, Maimonides did it a, several, about almost four centuries earlier, right? Like tried to just reduce. Here's the Jewish law, right? So now you can go do other things that he thought were more spiritually important. Um, but it was uh, tremendously controversial because people were like, who is this guy? Right? Who is this Moshe bin Maimon from the suburbs of Cairo to make all these decisions where the rabbis of the Talmud have disputed of the rules, right? They, who is he to cut out all the, the, the machloket? So what happens continually is that somebody writes a code, like here, I've, I've given you the only guide you need, and other, if it doesn't get burned, which did happen to Maimonides' mission at Torah, if, if people don't start throwing it on the pyre and burning it, then they start writing commentaries on it, right? And what does that have the effect of doing? It reintroduces the multivocality. So the fact is now, I mean, I think Rabbi David, did you study Shulchan Aruch as part of ordination prep? Like, okay, some, so you didn't study it without like the 17th and 18th, 19th century commentaries, am I right? Okay, right, so it's never just like, here's what Kara said, what did these six other people say about what Kara said? Okay. Um, that's the short answer. So, you know, you, you of course asked a really complex question. Um, okay, I will, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up in five minutes or so. <clears throat> now, the, who said something, who made a joke? It's not me. Right? <laughs> Okay, I miss that. Uh, um, I'll, I'll try not to be hurt. I'll try not to have my feelings hurt. Weisberg. I have no suspicion that it was Weisberg or anything. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. It's like, you know, I took off my watch so I would know what time it was. It's like the joke about the, the um, church group that's getting a tour of the synagogue. And they ask, you know, what's the symbolism of that? It's not there. You know, the light over the, what's symbols of the ark? What does what the light over the ark mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? And then they, they look at the rabbi's podium and there's a clock and they say, what does it mean to have a clock on the rabbi's podium? And the guy giving the tour says, when our rabbi starts to speak, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell if Robert Rouse is laughing because he has a mask on. <laughs> okay. Do I, do I have to do tshuva? <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Okay. So, look, one, one obviously, um, this, this is not the kind of, uh, this is not the kind of situation in, in philosophically where we say, um, you know, you, your, your um, choice is made based on your ethnic background, right? Whether you're Sephardi or Ashkenazi. This is one of those situations where you have to um, you have to engage in some moral reasoning and look at look at more than one text. I mean, I'm really I'm just trying to give you a taste today, and also in the, you know in all seriousness, in, in the hope that it it arouses enough interest, like to come back in January, and we'll talk about a, a really complicated abortion case on, on that. That I think it's the um, January eighth. We're going to do this. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, 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 we'll talk about that, and I promise to bring more than one text, right? I'm not, not going to bring you all 25 texts that are in the chapter about abortion, but we'll, we'll do enough to go to dig into it a little deeper and to, to argue a little more thoroughly about it. I mean, what, what happens is that 
various writers take, you know, study essentially the same material and choose which ones they think need to be emphasized and which ones get a little less play. Uh, to satisfy their, in some ways, satisfy your own moral instincts. You build the best case you can. Sarah should protect herself from her mother, as Isubis would imply, unless and until her mother repents. Or Sarah has no choice but to show the appropriate, or to show rather the commanded honor and reverence, uh, regardless of her mother's earlier conduct. And whether whether Sarah also wants to engage her mother in a conversation about the ways mother hurt her um, is, is, would, would, become, would become a separate issue. Uh, one, of the, <clears throat> one of the joys of this kind of study is listening to the clash of these voices. And one of the beautiful things about our tradition, I think this is one of the, one of the things that led me into the rabbinate, you know, if, I'm, if I'm honest, is the, the possibility of adding our own voices to this. And we don't, um, you can, again, you can read more about this in the introduction, right? Since we, we don't move in the circles that take, you know, like this text is the final word because it is the Shekhan Aruch, and you know, we are less or something like that. On the contrary, we take it as an invitation to engage in a kind of dialogue with them. The, the machloka continues, and part of the reason is that it's an oral tradition, is that we continue to discuss it now and in the future. So thank you for learning with me. And, um, yeah, and